Sometimes I don't have the energy to start a big new project, much less work on it. Sometimes I just want to work on something small and contained. Using materials I already have laying around, at least as far as possible. Little snack projects. These are their stories. This is my mill vise. I keep meaning to replace it with something better, or at least remove the swivel base that I almost never use but eats up a noticeable percentage of my total working volume. But this is it for now. This is the handle that came with it. I hate this handle. It's cumbersome and slow to use, so I bought this one off eBay. It seems to have been owned by Mike in the past. Thanks, Mike. It's been a big improvement. Except it's just too easy to knock off. You do want these removable for access and clearance and portability reasons, but it shouldn't be that easy. So I figured, let's add a basic ball detent. I've always meant to make one of those anyway. Uh, detent is kind of a vague term for basically any kind of mechanism that holds something in a specific position or orientation. The little ball that holds the socket in place on a wrench, that's a detent. The pawl in the wrench, which only lets the socket rotate in a single direction, another detent. The little clicks you feel turning the wiper control in a car? Detent, detent, detent. A ball detent is possibly the simplest version of this. Drill a hole. Drill a larger hole, but not quite all the way through. Put a ball bearing in the hole, followed by a spring, and close up the wide end. The spring pushes the ball bearing down. The ball projects through the narrow hole, but it can't go all the way through. It can be pushed back up against the spring with a bit of force. Match that with a divot or groove in the mating surface, and you've got a detent. First, I went through a box of ball bearings and found one that seemed like a good size. Next, I needed a spring. Sadly, my spring collection was not up to the task. I had to order an assortment to get ones that fit, but now my spring collection is that much more capable. I whipped up a prototype version in some scrap to make sure it would function well enough, and it did. There was a tangible click as the bearing seated into the little divot. So I did it for real in the vice handle. Aligning the flat of the internal hex seemed daunting, until I realized I could use a reasonably true piece of scrap as a rest. Then it was a matter of drilling the small through hole, then the wider hole the bearing would sit in, and tapping it so a set screw could hold everything in place. Because there was such a limited amount of material to thread, I even got to break out a bottoming tap to get as close to the bottom of the hole as possible. Drilling the divots in the vice lead screw posed an interesting problem. I wanted to hold it in the mill, it could go in the vise, but if I removed it from the vise, the vise couldn't hold it. I could use toe clamps to hold it on the table, of course, but that sounded awkward. Plus, then I would have to tram the vise back true again afterwards, and I am very, very lazy. I think the three cardinal virtues of the programmer, laziness, impatience, and hubris, really apply to machinists as well, or any creative endeavor, really. Instead, I extended the mill's ram out and drilled it in situ. To hold the thread screw rigidly in each orientation, I closed the vise on a little machinist jack, which I could adjust back and forth in length so that the target face on the lead screw was leveled as desired. Very pleasing. End result? It's not quite as grippy as I had wanted, because the fit on the shaft is pretty loose. I should probably add another two or three ball detents around the handlebar to improve its grippality. Grippaciousness? Grippitude? Anyway, it's definitely an improvement. Satisfaction quotient? Two out of three handle spokes. This is the Wilton vise I restored not long after moving into this location. It ended up mounted on the big fab table in the inner shop. It's a bit oversized for the work I tend to do in here, but it would look frankly a bit ridiculous mounted on the comparatively tiny welding table in the outer shop. I found that I tend to leave these incredibly crude jaw covers on, so the jaws don't mar whatever is being held. I spent like 30 seconds making these a year or two ago, and they're quite terrible. Absolute garbage, really. There is no shortage of products to solve this problem, but what's the point of having a machine shop if you're just going to buy everything? I had an idea for a fun solution, but it required a better way to hold material in the shaper. Mine didn't come with a vice C, which is a common problem. You can learn all about that in my video on getting it up and running. Luckily, I found a workable replacement after only about 8 months of searching. I wasn't going to demand it was a shaper vise, but it did need to be able to mount on the table, with the 8-inch spacing between the outer two T-slots. I'm pretty happy with what I found. It even matches the aesthetic of the shaper pretty well. With the working vise, I could finally do one of the things I wanted a shaper for in the first place. Flat, linear knurling. You know, 
like on vice jaws. First I needed blanks though, and sadly I didn't have any good aluminum stock on hand that would have let me cut the knurling on them as a single unit, only to be cut apart at the end. Instead I had to make some very lengthy cuts on the vertical bandsaw, then clean up and knurl each individually. It took a bit of experimentation, but I ended up cutting each groove 0.025 inches deep, moving the table over 0.1 inches between each cut. It was slow, tedious work, but the good kind of tedious. Okay, maybe laziness and impatience aren't such great virtues after all. I'm not giving up on hubris, though. Then I just had to drill and counterbar the jaws and mount them to the vise. Result? Fantabulous. They look so good that part of me doesn't want to use them. I was originally planning to cut some rounded grooves for holding round parts, like commonly come molded into rubber jaw covers but they're just so pretty I don't want to. Maybe after they're chewed up a bit and I have a specific need for grooves. Maybe. Satisfaction quotient? Four out of four Jaws movies. This is my cargo bike. I got some questions about it after the talkie toaster video, so. It's made by Bamboo Cycles in Mexico City. I believe it's their Merced model, but I bought it used, so I'm not actually sure. And don't judge them by the quality of this composite layup. The previous owner said it came as a flat pack kit and he did that part. I wasn't looking for a bamboo bike, really just any front loader Bachfeet style bike with a lot of cargo capacity, but the price was right and I gave it a go. I've had it for about two years now, with some pretty heavy usage and it's holding up great. The frame flexes a bit more than normal, but nothing catastrophic. I added an electric assist motor last year, and it has completely changed my riding habits. I ride two to three times more often now, and I do almost all my local errands on it. I can get a full shopping cart's worth of groceries in it with a bit of tetrising, though it has also carried ladders and lumber and concrete and household hazardous waste. According to the odometer, I've put over 1,900 kilometers on it since adding the motor. I also made the lid, primarily for security so I can run multiple stop errands, but also for weather protection. It's a slightly weird design, but having two-thirds of it hinged means that the lid can lean back against the handlebars and stay open on its own. And the rear is only held on with these two socket cap screws, so I can easily remove it using the tools I always ride with, in case I suddenly need to carry something really awkward. It's worked out pretty well. Except. It definitely does keep the rain out until you open it. At that point, all the water on the front two-thirds of the lid rolls down and falls straight through the piano hinge. Many a time I've arrived somewhere to open it, only to see otherwise perfectly dry cargo get deluged in a neat little line. The solution was obvious. Add a rubber strip under the piano hinge. But I had riveted it in place. And not only is drilling out rivets a pain, but setting that many rivets by hand is actually a lot of work. So I kept putting it off. Until I realized that the wet half of the Seattle meteorological calendar was almost upon us once again. And then I did something smart. I bribed myself with the purchase of a pneumatic pop rivet gun. This thing is pretty cool. As quick to use as a manual tool, it shoots the stem out without even needing to shake it, and there's almost no recoil compared to when doing it manually. If you've ever been riveting a surface you don't want marred, something nicely painted or soft aluminum, say, it takes a lot of effort, luck, and ideally masking to keep the manual setters from jumping around when the stem breaks and all the tension is released. So yeah, turns out these cheap pneumatic guns are actually pretty great. My cap firmly over the wall, I set to work drilling out the old rivets to remove the hinge. I use it as a template to mark the position for all the holes in the rubber strip. Conveniently, these didn't need to be super precise, being in rubber which could stretch a bit for added position tolerance. I'm not sure how you would annotate that in GD&T. Is that maximum material condition? That's usually a good bet. I punched out the holes using one of the hole punches for my old cocktail engine project, which was still filled with punch card chad from the last time I had that thing set up for an event. I mounted both the rubber strip and the hinge in place on the lid, using some screws to hold it in place for riveting. Yes, I know, I should get a good set of Clecos, the tools designed to do this exact thing in a much easier and faster way. Maybe if I find myself doing a lot more riveting with the new gun. Which performed admirably, Finishing the job in about one quarter of the time and one sixteenth the effort is doing it manually. Result? Very waterproof. I should have found thinner rubber though, as it acts like a spring, wanting to hold the lid in this awkward middle position. But that's a small annoyance, well worth it for the dark, damp months to come. Satisfaction quotient? 
well, 11 out of 14 days of rain on the two-week forecast. My vertical bandsaw came with this very serious guide fence, but the adjustment screw on it only had a jagged, broken-off crossbar to serve as a grip. Naturally, I tended not to use it much. So, on a caffeine-fueled late-night bender, a theme common to many of these projects and the editing of this video, I decided to make a replacement. First, figuring out what the thread is. Looking at it, I had guessed 3816, but the scale of the machine had confounded my estimation skills once again. It was actually one half 13. A sacrificial bolt was quickly found and decapitated. Now it just needed a good knob. Some two inch aluminum rounds seemed promising, so I cut a chunk off and cleaned it up on the lathe. I didn't bother with plans or anything, just some vague ideas. Sometimes it's more fun to wing it. The back was drilled and threaded, and some red Loctite was used to hold in the bolt. Technically, it was a working knob at this point, but torquing a smooth round disc by hand isn't ideal. It needed more gription. This could have been done with knurling, of course, but I'm not very good at that, and I don't think it would look good at this scale anyway. So why not some nice beefy grooves around the perimeter? Held in a collet block, that's easy enough to do. And since heptagons are still the bestagons, yes, I'm sticking with that bit, I decided to use my new seven-sided collet block for the purpose. I found it's a lot better to cut grooves in this orientation, using a ball end mill cutting horizontally across the piece, as compared to diving down vertically with a normal end mill. The cutting forces doing that are so high the piece often spins in the collet block. Final result? You'll have to take my word for it, but it feels absolutely perfect in the hand. And looks quite handsome on the bandsaw, I think. Satisfaction quotient? Seven out of seven vertices. One last project, this one medium-sized. I bought this oxy-fuel kit for some repairs on my migration sculpture over the summer. It's something I had been meaning to buy for quite some time anyway. Having a way to heat chunks of metal that can't fit in the forge seemed like it would be pretty useful. I don't really need to do any gas welding, though, because that's slow and expensive and I'm terrible at it. I don't need to do any gas cutting, either, because why use gas when you can use plasma? So I just really wanted a nice big rosebud tip and whatever gases would serve to get metal very hot. Bright orange hot, but not blindingly white welding hot. So I went with oxypropane instead of oxyacetylene. Propane costs about half as much as acetylene does, and you can get it far more places, pretty much anywhere in the country, even on Sundays. That emergency passed, and the kit sat in a pile in the outer shop, waiting for a permanent home. Given the width of the propane tank, not many welling carts would be able to hold these. And again, why buy when you can spend twice as much and uncounted hours making it yourself? Seriously though, never count the hours. Something shouldn't be quantized, it just invites all kinds of bad thinking. I made some sketches for this one, but mostly it was still improvised as I went along. I had a lot of three-quarter inch square tube with one-eighth inch walls, so I used that for the frame. I even finally cut up these pendulum arms from the prototype harmonic fire pendulum back in 2012. Never throw out anything. I recently added this cheap LED light to the horizontal bandsaw, after seeing someone mention the idea online. You move the light back and forth and up and down, until it casts a nice sharp shadow of the blade onto the part. Then you can use that to very precisely line the blade up with the cut line. It's quick and easy once set up, particularly compared to my old technique of closing one eye and squinting. I had two main goals with this design. Stability and portability. We live on like 12 different fault lines here, so it really needs to not be prone to tipping over during an earthquake if I'm ever going to feel safe leaving it sitting around with the regulator on instead of the armored cap. On top of that, it should be able to handle fairly rough terrain for use in the field. Some of my sculptures are in literal fields, after all. Side-to-side -side stability wasn't a concern, but back and forth was. This would be improved by the deep base and some wheels, but adding some more mass down low certainly wouldn't hurt. Conveniently, the only sheet I had of any thickness for the bottom plate was this quarter-inch weathering steel left over from the Growing Together project. I was a bit worried how much flex there would be in the frame, since the tubing was on the flimsy side, but it didn't seem that bad during actual tests. I added the chain restraints next, just to be sure. I used the same design as on the MIG card I made 10 years ago, with shackles attaching the chain to eye bolts screwed through the frame. It's a bit overkill, but I hate having tanks bang around as you move them. 
This lets all the slack be taken up by screwing in the eye bolt more, holding the tanks firmly against the cart. With the chains in place, I was confident the flexing of the frame was acceptable. I decided not to add the second brace, as cool as it would have looked. Next, wheels. It would need wheels in order to be mobile. I chose these because I wanted larger diameter for handling rough terrain, something other than hard casters for the same reasons, and I thought the wire spokes would look classy. These are solid rubber tires though, not pneumatic ones. Those seemed like a bad idea given the hot slag this thing will almost certainly be rolling over at some point. The wheels would need an axle. Keeping it simple, and heavy, I used this bit of scrap. Prepping it just meant cleaning up the ends on the lathe, turning them down to the 5 8 inch hub diameter, and cutting some grooves. Held in place with snap rings, the wheels were firmly and elegantly mounted. The axles were welded in place via these standoffs, which I drilled on the mill for a nice conformal mounting to the axle. These moved the axle back to improve its geometry, so you could get good ground clearance without holding it completely horizontal. Plus, it provides the perfect surface to step on when levering it back off the ground. One thing I've always wanted for a kit like this is a gas saver. These are basically a pair of valves, normally open, with a long arm that closes them if pulled down. Hang a torch from there and it does what it says on the tin, shutting off the flow of gas. This little nub here allows a small flow of fuel gas out, so you can have a pilot light available to relight your torch. With the gas saver, you can be working on a project with a torch, then hang it on the hook when not needed. The gas flow stops. Then simply pick the torch back up, starting the gas flow again, and relight it off the pilot light. This saves gas, hence the name, but more importantly for me at least, it also saves mental focus points. I have a lot of trouble concentrating on a problem when I know there is something consuming a valuable resource, burning dollars and emitting carbon, while I stand there unable to focus on the exact problem that, ironically, is what is keeping me from getting back to using the torch. So, yeah, it seemed like a good investment. I just needed to figure out a good way to hang the torch off the rod. These are usually used in glass studios for smaller torches that can hang easily off a hook like this. I could have attached it with some wire, but instead I made a completely over-the-top little hook that just perfectly holds the torch with about 20 thou of clearance. I have no defense for this, other than it made for a really enjoyable night out in the shop. With that, it was down to fitting out the cart with all its accessories. First, a reel for wrapping the hose around made out of some 4-inch pipe. I marked the matching curve with a compass and freehanded a pair of tabs with an angle grinder and belt sander to hold the hoses in place. I need to remember to freehand stuff more often. Just because I can do something perfectly on the lathe doesn't mean that I have to. A little basket shelf thing for holding the armored cylinder cap and goggles and other random bits and bobs. It's a literal pain to work with, but I love using expanded metal mesh for things like this, as dust can't accumulate in the bottom. And this will live in the outer shop, where things get very dusty at times. Some handlebars to make moving it around a bit easier. To check the proposed angle, I first cut this little test piece, and then committed to it on a piece of 7 8 inch stock. With an upvote to hold them perpendicular, welding them in place wasn't too hard. A hook for mounting the striker, plus a chain to attach it, so you can simply drop it once the torch is lit. You've got enough things to be thinking about at that point, waving a wand of super hot fire around without worrying about putting the striker down neatly. In a pleasing bit of recursion, I bent the hook in situ using the torch to heat it up. Plus it let me say in situ for a second time this video, which is frankly its own reward. Then a coat of primer followed by a coat of paint. And finally the finishing touch you didn't know it needed, sparkly handlebar grips. I wouldn't normally go with such vibrant colors, but I figured I should challenge myself. Oh, and also one of these valve caps I recently added to my other welding tanks. The red stripes are revealed as you twist the valve open, and then disappear again once it is closed, making it very clear from across the room whether you forgot to close it once you were done or not. I've done that more than once, and it was such a clever little solution I couldn't resist. And that's it for real this time. Result? A rather striking addition to the shop, if I do say so myself. Satisfaction quotient? Let's round up and say 2,000 out of 2,000 pounds per square inch. Well, that's enough for this video. Tune in next time for the restoration of a Geochron device.
or a mechanical implementation of Wolfram rules for elementary cellular automata. Or maybe it will be the atomically modular keyboard project I've been working on for over a year at this point. Or the aluminum tube kayak I need to get back to working on. Who knows? I remain, as always, at the mercy of my muse. Cheers, and happy holidays.